Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for coming, uh, for being here. Um, this is my first presentation at the, at the VegFest, uh, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, uh, to be able to take, take part. Uh, I, uh, my name is Amir Kassam, um, and I uh, am going to talk about sustainable farming for a vegan world. Now, this is a big title, world. And, uh, um, sustainable, I and mean, these, these are these are big, big, big sort of words. But I do uh, have have a, an edge on many people. I moderate a global platform on what we call conservation agriculture, community of practice, and and I've been doing that for the last over over ten years now. And that gives me a window to look through and what's happening in the world, especially in the area of sustainable. Agricultural, uh, agricultural management, but I also um, uh, operate with with several several uh, institutions. I have a professorship at Reading University. Um, this platform is hosted by the Food and Agriculture uh, uh, Organization of the United Nations. Uh, I work with the Tropical Agricultural Association. Uh, I chair uh, an advisory panel for Africa on sustainable agriculture. Uh, this is the European Federation uh, body uh, based, based in Brussels, where I'm on the board. But this one here is a, a farmers association in the UK on conservation agriculture, which is a no to a system. And I uh, uh, happen to be the vice chair uh, of that. So these things tell me a lot about what's going on in the world and what should happen, what is not happening. Uh, so um, I stand here before you with that sort of background. I'm going to try and cover uh, four things. Uh, what is conventional crop farming? How sustainable it is? So then we will uh, look at sustainable crop farming, the need for a paradigm shift uh, to conservation agriculture. Again, that's a big, big sort of term, a paradigm shift. And I will uh, try and convince you that we really are in desperate need to shift to a different way of thinking about agriculture. And then I just want to finish off with uh, uh, three issues which seem to be uh, making a lot of news about organic farming, uh, animal agriculture, GMOs, and, and agrochemicals in, in agriculture. And we'll draw some uh, uh, conclusion, general conclusions. Before we go forward, um, I want to show you a two-minute video, but many of us, including vegans, know that animal agriculture is, is unsustainable. It is there, pushed forward by different kinds of forces, but how many of us uh, actually know uh, about how sustainable is our conventional crop agriculture? I, don't, I think that we basically don't really question it. Some do, but most, most of the consumers, public, think that somehow we've got farming under control. Whereas in reality, we've got farming out of control and our food system is out of control. Um, but let's look at, uh, look at uh, a, a two minute video. And this is a video uh, on the ground swell. Okay. Ground swell is a uh, farmer group led by John Sherry family in Hatfield. And they run uh, every year a no-till show and no-till conference. And it is an absolute delight to be there. Um, Six, seven hundred farmers turn up and uh, and talk about the new new way of farming. They tend to use the word conservation agriculture, but also regenerative agriculture. And this is uh, uh, they made a film, uh, but this is just a trailer uh, on of 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 this one hour film.
For over 70 years, farmers have been pressured to make agriculture and food production more and more industrialized. We've been losing land area, essentially from erosion, at the rate of about 10 million, 7 to 10 million hectares per year, which is almost the size of Portugal. And you could see from satellite vast amount of topsoil leaving the United Kingdom into the ocean. The government for many years didn't recognize the soil at all as an important resource, and now they do. In October 2017, the UK government announced that we are 30 to 40 years away from the fundamental eradication of soil fertility. The damage was done when John Deere um, invented his total inversion plough, went deep, we denuded 18 inches of soil instead of eight. We've got to do something about it. We take from the land, we then feed it full of chemicals and, and rubbish stuff, and then we kind of harvest substandard crops. And it's just like, how has the system become this way? The good news is that farmers have developed an agricultural system to save our planet. It's called conservation agriculture, or no-till farming. Here we are on a farm which is in no-till since 1980, so 36 years of uh, no-till. This is a good soil there with no compaction. It's, uh, and this is not dirt, it's soil. <laughs> the main tool is not the tractor, the main tool is, is the soil. A handful of healthy soil contains more living creatures than there are humans on the planet. Most of them be microscopic. John Cherry is so energized by the amazing results on his farm that he and his family have started an annual no-till conference, the first of its kind in the United Kingdom. And that is a trailer to this one-hour film, which I would recommend for, uh, you should watch if you have time. Um, Okay, um, as we move forward into this presentation, I'd like you to keep in mind all the way through that agriculture occurs on a piece of land, on, on, on a soil. Um, and that soil, by and large, so far has been treated as if it's an inert entity. You can kick it around, you know, regard it as dirt. But when you look at it, uh, it, it, is a, it is a healthy soil, has uh, all kinds of living creatures, uh, bacteria, fungi, uh, earthworms, mesophyta, and, and many, many, many living organisms. But within the soil, there are processes occurring, chemical, hydrological, biological, uh, thermal, and of course, the gravity works uh, uh, on, on soil. And, and if when you're farming, then of course you have a cropping system which is managed by the farm. So soil is a, is a living, living uh, system, and its health and productivity depends on it being managed as a complex biological system rather than just an inert, in, inert uh, geological entity. Secondly, we really are. Uh, as John Cherry said, that in one, one sort of teaspoon there are, there are more, more organisms than, than the population of human beings in this world. But uh, when you look at the food web uh, in the soil, it is so rich and we don't even understand what, what is going on. But we know enough now that, that this is just soil health and soil life is, is extremely important. But if you, if you look at the, the surface, you've got uh, ground nesting birds, uh, starling, lapwing, uh, uh, wagtails, and, and these are these are basically uh, almost told to get out of the farm because we, we want to we want to sort of uh, uh, plow up your, the topsoil. But under, underneath you have uh, you have a whole host of uh, uh, organisms as well, and, uh, and they live in, in, in harmony with each other. Uh, if you let them. But the minute you start disturbing this, this is, you upset the whole balance. Uh, and of course, above the ground, you have uh, ladybirds and other 
what we would regard as sort of natural enemies of, of, of potential pests. Uh, you got frogs and, and uh, ants, spiders, and, uh, termites, and, uh, and so forth. Um, and yet we basically uh, don't pay any attention to this in the so-called modern, modern agriculture. And thirdly, thirdly, that soil, agricultural soil, sits in, in a landscape. So when we uh, disturb a piece of soil, eventually, eventually, we're talking about disturbing the function of the whole landscape. Uh, and and this, this, is, this is extremely important because from the farm into the landscape, we basically then uh, deliver to the society many, many so-called services, public, actually public services, known as sort of environmental services, which nature, actually nature provides us free of charge, although of course they always attempt to, to privatize it, but these are actually, actually uh, uh, public goods uh, which uh, have been classified into four types, uh, supporting, supporting services which where no human being is needed. The world can function on its own without us uh, doing anything. Indeed, uh, this, this is the vast uh, solar energy, solar, solar pump running carbon cycle, water cycle, atmospheric circulation, producing a primary, uh, a primary production, soil formation. These, these things go on, and these are known as the life-supporting natural services that are given to, to, to society. But then out of that, you have regulatory services, uh, groundwater flow, stream flows, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so forth, pollination. And from the regulating services, we actually then get products food, nitrogen fixation, and, and, and so forth, uh, uh, fiber and, and you know, sources. And these three slides, I'd like you to keep this in mind as we, as we begin to, to move forward. This is how we farm, whether we are in the, in the low-income low countries, uh, and we're using a hand tool or an oxen a drone implement, uh, or any more than we get a tractor and, and start thrashing the soil really hard, you know, and, and then when we're really, really want time, we, uh, we say, oh, we need a reversible path. And, uh, and so this, this is the, the, the characteristic of our, of our conventional tillate-based farming. And if you practice this way, whether you're using a hoe or, uh, or, uh, or this is the disc harrow here or disc plow, or, or a, a rulers or more. Um, essentially, within 10 years, you essentially kill the soil. And you lose all the organic matter, because you're oxidizing it. You, of course, can, can imagine what happens to the architecture and the structure of the soil. You basically destroy it. Poor volume goes to pieces, the structure goes to pieces, and you have, on one hand, soil contraction. On the other hand, you start letting the soil start moving. And that is erosion, runoff and erosion. And also, all the biological life processes are become dysfunctional. And this has uh, uh, been going on for many, many years. And as you heard, actually Tony Reynolds said, that, that since we got the John Deere to give us the, 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 the plan, we essentially have hastened all the destructive processes uh, underneath. Underneath that soil, we have pulverized, pulverized uh, topsoil, and this is actually pulverized into powder. And as soon as rain comes, the, you know what happens? You just put a drop of water on on on, um, on powder, and it immediately seals. So you have a s surface sealing characteristic developing. You have compaction here, and then after a few years, you have a plow pan. It's almost like concrete. And we expect that when there is, say, I don't know, 10, 20 millimeter of rainfall, you, you, you think, oh, well, soil will take it all in. How? It starts sealing here, it's sealed here. You know, it's the only thing you can do is to start run up, running off. <clears throat> and when you're also uh, uh, disturbing mechanically, you're basically burning away carbon. You create a dust storm, massive dust storms are created now in Europe. And the one which was uh, 
last one, which was a very big one in the eastern part of Germany in uh, 2011, it led to 81 car pileup. And it killed nine people. And it came out of basically mental agriculture in that area, which basically creates this sort of dust. This is happening even in the UK now uh, and, and uh, elsewhere. And what happens is that you have the surface ceiling instead of having a soil surface which should be like this. Underneath this, you have this type of soil. Underneath this, you have this the same soil. Same soil. You treat it mechanically and you get compaction. Life disappears. There's no aeration. Whereas if you treat it biologically, you turn it into a sponge, and half of that pore volume, half of that pore volume can hold water. Here, there's hardly 10% pore volume. So it's not only so it can't take in the water, it can't even hold it. This is a picture I took when I was working in Tajikistan. And this is the uh, Tajikistan went through land reform, all these uh, ex Soviet. Uh, Republics uh, are going through land distribution, and here is a cooperative manager, cooperative manager, and they, these are side by side fields. He, he has been growing wheat here for nine years, and this soil has been turned into well, it's now very suitable for brick making. <laughs> <laughs> and and here the soil is undisturbed. It's part of an orchard, and this is. I took a sample from here, and it's the same soil, same soil, but one looks like this after nine years, and this is rich with, with, with organic matter, look at the color, and, and there, are, there are earthworms uh, uh, running around uh, in, in making biopores. This is Switzerland, uh, uh, beet, uh, sugar beet, and this is conventional uh, uh, management of soil, this is no till soil. This is a root crop. And you get water logging. And after a while, even if it's a level, level uh, field, water will develop its own head and will start running. And later on, it will start flooding. Um, so, poor infiltration. This happens in the, in the developing world as well. This is Malawi, for example. And what happens is that the, that the farmers are told, oh, you've got water now. You know, if you don't win, humanity will run away. Tie up the ridges. And we've been doing this for the last 50 years, telling the farmers, oh, yeah, this should be your traditional agriculture. And tie up the ridges. Tie ridges, and, and, and uh, that will help you uh, retain the water. The problem is, underneath there, underneath here, is that sealed hoe pan. And if you break the hoe pan, water will go through quite nicely. People say, oh, there are no trees, you don't get broken. You know, park trees. Well, here is, a, here is, here is a, uh, an orchard with lots of erosion. The problem is in Europe, in most places, we tend to plow and, 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 uh, and till underneath the, the, the crop. But you can stop all that with, with uh, this sort of system. Um, and uh, this is Germany. Um, this is a reservoir looking very nice, lovely landscape. You can drive around, not notice anything going wrong. But this farmer here has been dumping sediment into this reservoir. With it, organisms, fertilizer, pesticide, the lot. And he's paying through your tax, tax money to do that. Because nobody wants to bother to say, this is something we should not be doing anymore. You know? But he, this has been going on for many years. And I'm just taking you now to the landscape. At the landscape level, we really do a grand job of destruction. And what happens eventually, this is Lake Malawi. Lake Malawi. Now, you probably, some of you know, for, for almost 100 years, we've got a relationship with Malawi. We've been sending experts to Malawi. Sheep and Aldo Farm. This is a dead zone in the Lake Malawi. This is Brazil, 25 years ago, a colleague of mine took this picture. This is not English tea. This, this, is, uh, this is definitely millions of tons of topsoil going over the edge. And I'll show you the picture now, what that river looks like in, in, in a few minutes. This is 
this is interesting. This is uh, in Italy, a river Tiber. They've just all they've just lost this bank, and I just happened to be there. And I took this picture uh, it was, it was, it was five years ago. The whole the whole bank just just uh, uh, well just went down down to Austria, if you know Italy, and into into the ocean. This is the River Loddon. Loddon just comes from Reading, Reading University, our best ever. And that river here, River Lawton, then it's part of the Thames Valley, it drains into River Thames. And this river passes through this great important building. And it is carrying millions of tons of soil, but nobody's bothered. And in fact, 20 years ago, as Eric Pickle said, we stopped dredging our rivers because we can't keep up. And if you go further, and this is what is happening, that our country as a whole is losing vast amount of topsoil. And I mean vast amount of topsoil. And it's filling up our beaches, uh, rivers. But, in, uh, and there was a cabinet report done by uh, 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 Donald Curry, who was commissioned to do a report on, 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 on farming, the future of farming. And he concluded farming and food industry is on an unsustainable course in economic terms, also unsustainable environmentally. Agriculture now is the number one polluter of water in this country. And this is happening throughout the world. So we, what I've just shown you is not just Europe or UK problem, it is a global problem. And we have degraded most of our agricultural ecosystems throughout the world. And there's a very interesting book which appeared in 2007 by David Montgomery. Uh, it's not very expensive. I would thoroughly recommend that you read it. It is a two and a half thousand years history of what we've done to our land. And, uh, and this, this shows that we basically have, have reached a point where we have to seriously start questioning why is there such vast amount of degradation around us? And especially in the agricultural land. Um, there are um, um, uh, statistics, uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment showed that 89% of our ecosystems are severely degraded, only 11% are in reasonable shape. And since uh, the World War II ended, we've lost about half a million, 400 to 500 thousand hectares of agricultural land. Now the question is, if that is true, why don't we know about it? Because it doesn't appear in our agricultural statistics. What we are told by the Food and Agricultural Organization is the net area we found, but the gross area is increasing because we are losing around 10 million hectares of agricultural land every year. But the superficial figure tells us, oh, we're slowing down now, we're not expanding. But we do, we actually are expanding, and our marginal area keeps increasing. And this is the picture of cereal yields in Europe. Modern agriculture, for the last 25 years, our yields have been stagnant. Yeah? And uh, we, we, of course, uh, are told otherwise that we're making progress. We need technology, and that's what we need. We now need GMO, although we get it out of, of Europe, but, but that's what's going to feed the world. But for the last 25 years, UK, since 1996, we haven't moved forward in terms of productivity. And in fact, with productivity, which is an efficiency term, we move backward because inputs are going, so going up, and agrochemicals are going up as well, whereas the yields are plateaued at about seven tons. So, what is the consequence of our tillage-based crop agriculture? For agriculture and society, we now are facing higher and higher production costs, lower farm productivity, and profit, because those are two are related. But this is suboptimal yield ceiling, also in low, in low, low income countries. They can't get about half a ton of legumes and not one ton it's just impossible because their soils are dead, carbon content is less than 
you don't get any response, poor efficiency. But for the landscape, you remember that, that landscape slide? We have basically dysfunctional ecosystems. So they cannot filter our water, they cannot sequester our carbon. Even the habitat of a humble bumblebee is destroyed. Because people don't care where bumblebee lives, but bumblebee can't kind of live in the soil. All the agricultural birds are now on their way to extinction, more than 50%, because the farming doesn't take care of them. And then we have uh, uh, dysfunctional nutrient cycling, water cycling, and so forth. Now, we basically have a chance to switch over to a new paradigm. And this has been emerging over the last 70 years, and which is now called conservation agriculture, but you will hear other names. Uh, sometimes it's also called uh, permaculture. The core of permaculture is, 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 is no-till uh, agriculture and farming or managing land as close to nature as possible. And it all, it all started. It all started in the mid '30s with the Great Dust Bowl in, in, in America, uh, which, which uh, of course destroyed uh, uh, so much of the, the area of, of uh, mid, in, in the middle of America. Uh, basically, three years of continuous drought, and and John Deere's John Deere's stainless steel mobile plant were enough to take millions of tons of soil away all the way to New York and into the Atlantic Ocean. And, but since then, uh, there are enough people who actually said, well, there's something going wrong. And of course, America was the first country to start with soil and water conservation program, a huge conservation program. Unfortunately, the initial, uh, initial response was still very much earth-moving uh, protection. Uh, they went into what they call conservation tillage. And then in the 60s, 70s, it moved into no-till, uh, mulch-based uh, diversified cropping system. And that is what is called conservation agriculture. It, has, it is based on three principles, minimum or no mechanical disturbance, that means no-till seeding and uh, weeding, uh, enhancing uh, and uh, maintaining organic matter cover on the soil, to protect the soil surface, but also feed the soil biotin and, and keep them alive and so that they can function in a soil which is not being now uh, touched and uh, disturbed. And thirdly, to ensure that the cropping system, while being economically uh, market driven, but should be also environmentally driven so that you are uh, working with a set of crops which is pumping in nitrogen, it is uh, creating a spongy soil feeding the microbes and, and, and so forth. Along with other good agricultural practices is what we define as conservation agriculture. And it's like a foundation of a house. Without a foundation, you can't really feel that the house is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, robust. It will be vulnerable. And same thing in agriculture. But this is biologically active foundation. The current modern systems don't have that. And our universities don't really tell the students that that, that is the case. Uh, and you can now see immediately that this can be placed in any land-based production system from annuals, perennials, orchards, plantations, uh, and, and uh, uh, agroforestry, the rice system, even livestock uh, crop systems. Um, and it's basically, it, it's, it establishes a spiral of regeneration and enhancement. And this is why also it is known as regenerative agriculture. Why does it work? Because conservation agriculture is, it has many self-protecting, self-repairing characteristics, and it pays attention to ecological foundation uh, of, of production system, it pays attention to soil health, biology and function, it also starts paying attention to root system and its relationship with soil. Also, enhanced biodiversity. And that is extremely important above and below the ground surface. And also, the real weakness in the current agriculture is that we go for yield, 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 and we lose sight of all the other things which land has to do for society. And that is basically the, the environmental benefits which are, are, are 
offered by nature to, to society. And conservation agriculture actually does offer maximum output with minimum input and has very high resilience. And that basically leads to a system which we can say is a farmer can actually optimize whatever he's got in terms of resources. If it's low amount of resources, fine, but he will get or she will get the maximum output uh, from, from, uh, from the farming effort. Um, biodiversity is very important. For example, uh, if you look at the soil, we have, of course, lots of earthworms. There are no earthworms, hardly any, in the modern cultivated soil. Because, and because also in modern agriculture, we hardly feed the soil. We clear everything. We want a, a manicured uh, looking soil surface. And, and uh, if, if, it, if, it, if there's residue around, we think somehow there's something wrong. Earthworms, of course, uh, survive on, on, on biomass like us. They, they need uh, biomass. All the, all the, all the uh, microorganisms, they live on, on organic matter. But if you uh, look at uh, one of the major mi microorganisms, the fungi, mycorrhiza, there are several different types of mycorrhiza, uh, they attach themselves to the root system in some cases, and they form the internet underground. Each plant is connected to the, uh, through mycorrhiza. But they produce, now it's a fungi, so you can't photosynthesize. It lives off food being provided to organic matter. But what is special about mycorrhiza is that it produces carbon, which is called chromatin, it's a sugar protein produced by, by uh, mycorrhiza, and that provides the cement to bind soil particles into microaggregates and macroaggregates. And this, is, this cannot be produced mechanically. Um, even if it's a gold plate at a plow, you can't do that. And, uh, um, and if, if you look at uh, a soil in an in a, in a unplowed, uh, untilled condition, after a few years you find that it is very stable, the aggregate stability is very high, and its load bearing capacity is very high. But you take soil from, from till, till soil, and I, I do demonstrate this all the time, you put it in water, it goes muddy, it just boom, uh, it, uh, it can't hold itself. And that exactly happens in the, in the field. The second uh, thing about the biodiversity is that this incredible relationship between soil and, 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 the, and the plants around it, are, uh, microbes around it. Microbes uh, uh, metabolize into the root system. The root system provides exudates, a vast amount of exudates. There are uh, uh, figures of five to seven tons of carbon uh, exuded by, by crop. And of that, the microbes live. Fungi, hi-fi, for example, bring in all kinds of nutrients, water as well, and this is in the, happening in the rhizosphere. This is Tony Reynolds' farm. He has now, after 15 years of conservation agriculture, his initial carbon content was about uh, 2.6. He is now operating at 6. Multiply that by 1.7, and you get organic matter. So he is now already operating around 10, 11 percent organic matter. Uh, earthworm population, if you have a plowed uh, soil, you get basically the, the lumbricus uh, 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 numbers are very low, whereas if it's no tillage, almost as close to what is what, what you find in natural meadows. And this is what some people regard CAA. John Cherry said last year, he said, if you like your family, go for CAA. If you don't like your family, continue to do what you're doing and destroy the earth. Um, and this is a picture which, which I think captures that, that this farmer is now relaxed. The plow is being used for nesting uh, birds, and underneath him are his bioengineers' friends that are doing all the work for him. This is what it looks like in, in, uh, in again in, the, in terms of manual system, uh, animal drawn, small small tractor, uh, uh, horse drawn in Paraguay. Paraguay is interesting. It's, it's now the eighth largest exporter of soybean, but 70% of the farmers are small farmers, and most of them are still using livestock. You get uh, two wheel tractors with a, with a, with a uh, no till no drill mounted here, small tractor, but again, you can see that the ground is covered all the time. And, uh, and, and there are cropping systems which are applicable to any, any cropping system. This is still not in Europe. 
Uh, at the moment, we have 180 million hectares um, of uh, conservation agriculture in the world. It really took off in the 1990s, and this is now basically divided and increasing at the rate of 10 million hectares a year, which is the size of Portugal, for example. And it's divided equally, more or less equally, in the, in the south and in the north. So this is not uh, something where we can talk about uh, north giving south uh, a hand. Uh, in fact, at the moment, the north needs a hand from the south, uh, um, you know, southern, southern uh, uh, countries. Um, yeah, and that equates now, 180 million is not, not very small amount, but at the global level, it is 12.5% of the global arable land. And that, that has already it's reached a point of takeoff now, which, uh, which, which is a, 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 a nice uh, situation to be in. And then this is the, uh, the distribution. Most of the areas are in America and Australia, but now Asia, uh, Europe, uh, Africa also are, are beginning to move, move forward. Um, there are several drivers which, which are forcing farmers to, uh, farmers to, uh, to, uh, to think about a different way of farming, and if they know about CA, they go for it. And these are the kinds of seed cost of production, drought, erosion, massive soil degradation, and now, of course, Europe and, and, and Europe and UK are demanding that farmers uh, pr uh, deliver the environmental uh, services, but they don't quite know how to get it organized. Uh, and climate change is now upon us, and we need a, we need agriculture which is a mitigator. At the moment, our agriculture is a grand emitter of greenhouse gases, um, whereas CA conservation agriculture is a mitigator. And of course, we are also, we've learned in the last 10, 15 years that the modern agriculture is very anti-poor development. If you want something uh, suitable to poor regions, poor, poor, poor people, conservation agriculture does the trick. At the moment, most of the cost of the, uh, uh, the spread is led by farmers themselves, uh, and we now need support from the public, especially from the public, to demand that we have uh, uh, plant-based plant products from sustainable agriculture. But in terms of a benefit patent, we, we can offer from conservation agriculture better, better yield, uh, productivity profit, less fertilizer use, almost inputs are half in, in, uh, in, in conservation agriculture, and of course you can do it organically as well. Uh, very much less machinery, way down energy use, and of course you use less water. And land, of course, more people can be carried, and lower environmental costs, rehabilitation of degraded land. So there is now a, a possibility of, of, of rehabilitation. But in Brazil, for example, the area of maize has remained the same, but since they switched over to conservation agriculture, productivity has gone up more than double, and they use studies and less work than they used to do at this point. So enormous, uh, enormous gain, cleaner, cleaner water system, and, and also better uh, nutrient responses. This is a picture from Portugal, that if you have 1% organic matter, you need 160 units of nitrogen to produce three tons of, of uh, wheat. If you have 2% nitrogen, uh, organic matter, you need, you need 98 percent, 98 units of, of, of nitrogen. But if you take it to 3 percent, then you would produce higher yield, much higher yield, but with only 37 units of nitrogen. So this is the kind of efficiency gain we're talking about. Lots written about it now from, uh, from different parts of the world, for smaller scale uh, farmers, uh, small scale farming, large scale, and books and papers have been written about it. I'll just give two examples of what really happens at the large scale. Alberta, Alberta in Canada is 100% uh, is no-till farming, conservation agriculture. And there they run a carbon trading scheme. And farmers get paid, at the moment now, close to $30 per ton of carbon sequestered. There's no hope in hell for UK to be able to do it because that current agriculture can't sequester carbon. And the second example is this, you remember what I showed you in this picture? This river now, which flows into this, one of the largest hydroelectric power in the world, I tumble down, this water is now more or less clean. 
and the life, uh, operating life of this dam is now increased to 200 years, whereas when they built the thing with this water flowing in, it was estimated to be 30 to 40 years. So this is in Brazil, and, and the whole basin is being managed under conservation agriculture. Um, so, now quickly, there are these issues which, which can keep coming, coming, uh, coming up. Uh, how sustainable is conventional organic farming? You can now see that organic farming is actually like conventional tillage agriculture. They said, we don't do this, we don't do this, we don't want GMOs. Essentially, what is left is basically conventional high disturbance agriculture. Unless organic farming moves into sea organic farming, which I consider the best, they will continue to contribute to unsustainability. Um, what about other animals? Now, we, we saw, for example, uh, that, that there are lots of animals in farming. Earthworms, all the, all the insects, all the arthropods, they are all very important. All the, all the uh, natural enemies of pests, for example, we want all of them in that farming, but we've got to provide them with a habitat. And, and uh, in terms of large, large animals, my own feeling is, that a lot of those animals are just not needed. And they could go back into, uh, areas could go back into rewilding. And please, I am quite convinced that we don't need, although we are told that we need livestock into our farming to capture sustainability. You couldn't be, it couldn't, that couldn't be further from the truth. You don't need livestock to sustain uh, 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 your farming. And, uh, and uh, biodiversity, including all the free living animals, they're, 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 they're going to be around, and I'm going to finish off with a little uh, video about that. What about GMOs and agriculture? There are no GMOs here. Conservation agriculture appeared well before GMOs. And even where, there are basically five GMOs, which, which we tend to hear about. Uh, and those, those are grown together with non GMOs in South America, America, North America as well, and Australia. But essentially, we do not actually need GMOs. These are bred to respond to higher and higher input, which keeps continuing to pollute our, our, uh, our, uh, our world. Agrochemicals, we can bring, it, bring them down, way down now. And, and as we understand more and more about how soil biology works, we can really, really bring it down to almost negligible amounts. Finally, uh, we can now say that CA represents a global agricultural revolution is the paradigm though, because we now need, this is flat earth moving to round earth mindset. And, and we now see globally it, it is at the basis of a truly sustainable agriculture, originally farmer driven, but essentially including paid by donors and so forth, is now becoming a structural response. But this is not enough. We need the public, especially the vegan community, and moving to demand plant-based products that are produced with conservation agriculture, particularly organic systems. This is the farm which uh, I, we have our Notre Association Secretary. This is Tony Reynolds, you just heard. And this is mm, seven years ago. And he was showing us how earthworm ridden his fields are. And he showed, he pulled that out and then and the biocore from earthworm was one centimeter in diameter. We were just flabbergasted. And, uh, and this uh, farm is just, just running around. He said, my earthworm are rattled. That's it. Um, if we have, I don't think we have time to do it, so. Otherwise, I would have shown you a, a little video. But thank you very much for listening.